we didn't just land on the earth from somewhere, we came out of the earth. So, you know, yes. we're all coming from this kind of same place, plants and people. And if you look at indigenous cultures, so people who kind of are endemic to their place, who still live where their ancestors lived and they have that knowledge, you see that plants are integral to their lives. And, I, and you might be thinking like food or medicine, but also like musical instruments and housing and uh, anything, you know, the baskets that they carry everything in, all that their clothing, it, it all comes from plants. And that ethnobotany covers all of that. Yeah. And sometimes the term economic botany is used um, to just talk about how people use plants economically in any classification. Um, what I think for what I'm doing now at, at Harvard and MIT, uh, the most interesting things are looking at that indigenous knowledge and thinking about how it might be applicable to the things that we're doing now. What can we learn from indigenous people? Boom! What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are at the Harvard Science Center at Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are now going to be talking about ethnobotany. We have Dr. John De La Parra joining us on the show. Hello. Hey, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited to talk to you. Really appreciate Alex K. Chen making the bump for us to connect and make this happen. Dr. John De La Parra is an associate at Harvard University. He's a research lead at the Open Agriculture Initiative at MIT Media Lab. He's a lecturer of environmental studies at Tufts University and a lecturer of biotechnology at Northeastern University. All right, John, let's start things off with our favorite question here. We love to start it off with, we find ourselves as stewards of Earth. What is your current take on the state of humanity? The state of humanity. So, as you mentioned, my expertise is ethnobotany. So I'm looking always at how humans and plants are interacting. Plants, in a lot of ways, are kind of a true crystallization of life on Earth because they can't run away from things. They have to live where they are. You know, they have to, they, that, that actually advantage of not having to run away means that they do very interesting things. Humans, I think the, what, what happens in the, for, the, for the questions about the state of humanity, um, humans have the ability to, in some ways, overpopulate their spaces. Yeah. So I think that one of the most pressing issues in this, for the state of humanity is, is overpopulation. I think that that's something that in certain areas is causing fights over resources and things like that. So I think that um, we're at a beautiful place now where we have an opportunity to start thinking about how we use those resources. That could be the plants or other things. Plants are always integral to that. Um, but as we educate each other and as we are able to speak about all these different interconnections between plants and people, that's when we can make that next leap forward, I think. So even though, yeah, I, I believe that there is this crisis of population um, that's happening, I think that uh, we have the solutions before us. I think that it, it, it's through education, that deep education to young people all the way through to older people can lead to, like I said, a great leap forward that really changes things. So hopeful, I guess. <laughs> yeah, 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 very hopeful. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And it was also it was very interesting. You you know you're making the the case for the the crystallization of the plants and the location that mm -hmm. they're set in versus the human and animal, um, the marine animals as well. Mm -hmm. Just being able to move uh, right. around. The, the other really interesting thing that that you said was that you're so right that we have in many places these centers that are filled with clusters of people right. and I think what we ended up doing was in many ways we want to surround ourselves with other really smart diverse people in close proximity so we don't have to transit too far mm -hmm. but at the same time it has uh, made for so much issues with with like you said uh, fighting over resources, um, rent in many places is very expensive, mm -hmm. um, slums exist, um, versus these open swaths of land around mm -hmm. the world that are just free for people to live on, basically. Right. So there's, a, there's that interesting dichotomy that you brought up as well. Yeah, I mean, and uh, swaths of land are usually not free for people to live on in general. I mean, we might, they're, they're, there's more space, right? I just, you know, we, we as humans have evolved to 
in, in, in some ways small groups with family members, extended family, and also relying on the sources that are around us. We did always have the ability to move around, but in some ways I think cities recall that wanting to have community. And people try to reconstitute that, that desire for community um, everywhere we go. But um, often, that, you know, I live in a city, even though I grew up on a farm, I grew up in a rural area. Um, and I find community in a city. It's a different type of thing, but often it can be more profound because um, you, know, you are up against each other and you do have to figure out how to share the space that you have around you. And, and plants mediate that interaction, I think, in many ways. Yeah, yeah, we're, and we're gonna get to that. I'm super pumped to unpack that. Let's do your journey. So, uh, born in Alabama, and then you had a very, you have uh, some roots from Mexico, mm -hmm. and then you had a grandmother that really inspired you in ethnobotany, yeah. so teach us about this. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I grew up uh, on a small farm in Alabama. Uh, mostly we had goats when I was a kid, and. Um, we also grew a lot of the food that we ate, so we did rely on the farm a lot. My parents still are on that farm, and they still grow a lot. They still grow food every year. They still have, I think, one goat left now. <laughs> but uh, that's those are my roots for sure. Um, my grandmother uh, used plants as a, when I was a kid, and that always fascinated me. So there was always this kind of folk knowledge. There was this um, almost spiritual connection that I maybe didn't realize because when you're a child, you know, like the fish doesn't notice the water around it and I didn't know what that was but it just was what life was um, and that always intrigued me to look more into it and it definitely reverberated later in life um, yeah and my, my father's family has roots in Mexico so uh, you know in my last name is Spanish I mean being that a little bit separate from the other Alabama society mm -hmm. uh, you know other people in society I think sometimes you find people come up with interesting lives because they've been isolated, I think, a little bit. So, you know, being in Alabama, being a little different, I think, made me more introspective, want to do something a little bit different, um, which eventually led me. So my last two years of high school, I was in a rural place uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. And but my last two years, I went to a boarding school in Alabama, state funded boarding school, the Alabama School of Math and Science. And if it weren't for that, I don't know what I would have done. Uh, luckily, the state had this vision to fund this project, and they about a hundred students from around the state were allowed to come. And my parents had no money, but this, but it was paid for by the state. So it was an amazing resource for me. And there, I met my fellow uh, wayward travelers, um, you know, kids from all around Alabama who didn't quite fit into the schools that they were in, but now they could be here and really kind of nerd out yeah. and also it was a very college-like atmosphere that was somewhat unstructured in that you know there were labs on Tuesdays and Thursdays and you know you kind of had to figure out how to manage your time. Then from there I uh, went to the Cooper Union which is in New York City um, an engineering art and architecture school. Mm -hmm. I had never been to New York City before so I was totally Alabama when I showed up in yeah. New York. I think the, I know the first time I went to New York was for the orientation for Cooper Union um, on top of it being New York City, uh, which is, can be overwhelming for anyone, and it's kind of the prototypical city, you know, if we're talking about rural versus city, um, it, it was also a very intense educational system. So I was studying engineering, um, and it was kind of like a boot camp mentality. I mean, your first year, everyone takes very difficult standardized classes that, you know, there might be giant lecture halls and there has to be a bell curve reinstituted over top of even the brightest people that show up. Uh, so that was really intense for me and I was always looking for nature. I remember going to Central Park and taking my socks and shoes off just so I could feel the grass, you yes. know, and be connected to earth, which seems like a somewhat trivial thing, but for me it actually was really meaningful really to important. have some connection. Or to take, you know, even a day or two trip out to visit someone at Vassar, which is in Poughkeepsie, a little bit farther off. That, you know, I could see trees and be yes. out in the woods a little bit. Yes. It, I, that is, I think, where I discovered the, some dichotomy of existence. Yeah. That, you know, there is this thing I knew as a kid in Alabama, and then there's the city, and you have to kind of balance those things in some ways. Yeah, you totally nail it there with farm versus Manhattan, right? Yeah. Those are... Yeah, those are <laughs> vast yeah. different extremes yeah. extremes and you're if we if we can get um a deeper sense of of connection to earth by doing things like just laying on the grass taking our shoes off yeah. just relaxing feeling earth the trees the plants mm -hmm. we can really 
tie better into that unity feeling that, that drives us, um, uh, that will drive us into a more sustainable future. Um, Okay, so as you're, you know, as you're getting, getting New York, you feel the dichotomy. You also end up uh, doing your PhD at Northeastern here in Boston. Yeah, and that journey was rather long and circuitous, so it wasn't a direct route for me at all. I mentioned this kind of pressure cooker situation of all my family being in Alabama, me being in New York City, a very foreign, bizarre place for me. Um, the first year I was there, I don't think I got on the subway once because I was just afraid of everything. <laughs> you know, I was 18, I didn't know what was safe and what wasn't, it was just overwhelming. Eventually, after a few years, I was totally relaxed there, but and now it feels like a second home to me because I had to, in some ways, become a man in this environment. Um, so, you know, the, there was that pull, that tension in my life, and then I was studying engineering, which was never exactly something I wanted, but Cooper Union, if you get in, it's free to go. Um, and my parents, like I said, they couldn't afford to send me to school, so it was the obvious choice for me. It was a good school and it was free. Um, but by the time I had reached the, the fourth year, it was actually um, 2001, 2002 in New York City. So September 11th happened. Um, freaked me out a lot. I didn't, Cooper Union is in Lower Manhattan. Oh, Canada. it's in Lower Manhattan yeah. too. So, uh, yeah, and I at one point lived on Gold Street, which is in the financial district. So it was disturbing to me because I had just become kind of comfortable in this place and now it seemed scary to me again. I mean, it was very disruptive. And uh, being in Lower Manhattan, like that part of the city was shut down for part of the, a couple, few weeks just in terms of transportation and stuff. It was very difficult. Um, so I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't want to be in New York. I just didn't want to be in New York anymore. Um, I wound up getting a job in the New York State Assembly as a legislative aide, and I worked there for a bit, um, which seems totally weird, but that's what I wanted. I wanted something that was completely different than what I've been doing before. I always had an interest in politics, of all things, mm -hmm. and I kind of, I've always had this thing in my life that I want to taste everything. Like I want to try a lot of different things, and I even tell my students now that sometimes it's about finding out what you don't like, not what you do like, um, and I've done a lot of that. And that's when that started. So I did that. Um, I still hadn't finished Cooper. So I had just a handful of credits left to finish, but I, I didn't care about it at that point. I just wanted to, I wanted to do things. I didn't want to be in school anymore. Um, so in my last year, I left and I did this. Um, found out I didn't really like that. Um, I eventually moved to New Jersey where I did other types of things. I did some consulting work. I eventually started taking classes in horticulture I, and I got a certified in horticulture because I wanted to get back to you know I guess in some ways in response to September 11th and the city I now wanted to be really into plants and really have that connection again mm -hmm. which symbolizes in some way where I came from yeah. and where I could go yeah. um, so then I, I did that I started studying that and at the same time I started teaching um, well I, I was able to finish my undergrad in that time and that took me several years. <laughs> I did that, and then I started teaching at a community college in New Jersey. I started teaching chemistry, um, and I loved it. I, I never thought I'd have the chance to teach. So for me, it was really magical to be in front of students that are mostly nursing students, which, you know, it's, they have a real mission. It's actually like a tactile thing they're going to do, and chemistry is usually the class they want to take the least. So, but I saw it as an opportunity to uh, show them practical things yes. because I also feel like I don't have a lot of patience for things that don't I can't understand why you're doing them yeah correct so when I would teach them chemistry we would always do things like I would you know bring an IV bag in and we talk about ions and like why would they ever need to know what an ion is if you know if they're not going to understand when they see it in a hospital what it mm -hmm. actually means mm -hmm. so I always tied things in the experiments with the my favorite part and I was also, of course, interested in plants. I had this horticulture background, and I was starting to get interested more in teaching people about medicinal plants. I eventually started a, a class that was called Medicinal Plants that um, a lot of people really liked, and I, I was really getting my footing just in having, in some ways, taught myself about the stuff, um, but inspired by my grandmother and other people in my life. Um, and that gave me an outlet, and I felt like, well, this is my special thing that I feel like I get up every morning to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I, and I, once I found that, I was like, okay, like I need to just keep building on this. Um, and that pressure of having to teach, especially something that you really care about, is it, it's a weird feeling, right? It's a, you may be like sweating, like this nervous anxiety sweat, but also you're loving what you're doing and you get addicted to it. So for mm -hmm. me, like 
I, like I said, I'm teaching four classes this semester. Like, I love it, and also like, it's like tense. It's like yes. it's like a, but you feel alive. I guess that's what it is. You're pushing yourself to the brink of your cognitive challenge. Yeah, I think yeah. every single day, and it's a performance. It's a high wire act every time. Yeah. I, I mean, I know there are people who prepare way ahead of time and they have their slides, but still, even. I don't always have the time to do that, but even when I do, it's still a performance. You know, you still what's going to happen in the classroom. If you're, I think if you're doing it right, it should be malleable. You know, because people are going to ask questions, totally. and the conversation is going to go a different way, and, totally. and that's how the learning experience really happens. Yes, yes, and you have to be prepared for all that. Um, yeah. So from there, I said, well, if I want to keep doing this on any other level beyond the community college level or whatever, um, I, sh I need to go to graduate school. Um, so I, f um, eventually I found a professor that I thought was doing something that pushed the boundary of chemistry, medicinal plants, biotech, the future of what could happen with medicinal plants. Because actually the truth is a lot of kids come to me and say, how do I study medicinal plants? How do I become an ethnobotanist? Mm -hmm. And the answer isn't easy. You have to be very determined because there aren't a lot of, there are some really great ethnobotanist mentors in the world and, and in, in the US, but not as many as there used to be. And it's not easy to find that track to do that. So the person I found was not an ethnobotanist at all, um, but they were doing something that was interesting to me. So I targeted them, I got into the program, and I learned all about plant tissue culture and different plant chemicals and things like this, and I loved it. Uh, but after two years, our paths kind of were divergent. I was going more in a different direction with analytical chemistry and looking at what's in these plants and how can we vary the, the chemical constituency of these plants. Um, so eventually I finished my PhD under a different professor, but it all, it shows you how like, even though you might have a singular mindset, like this is the person that's kind of driving me to do this, you have to be flexible enough to yeah. know when it's time to change course a little bit. Yeah. And that really opened up everything for me. Once I left that laboratory and I was able to be free from that and do other things that were more inventive, um, things got even more exciting for me, even though it was incredibly scary. And after that second year, when I thought it was gonna be all over, when I was gonna leave that lab, I thought, well, I'll get a master's degree, or who knows what I'll do, maybe I just have to leave and not finish this at all. Um, but that leap led to greater things, which is the thing that people yes. are always afraid of, and people tell you that, right, but you never believe it. <laughs> On the other side of the yeah. adversities is our greatest treasure. I, I fully believe that. I mean, the things I went through from Alabama, jumping to New York of all places, and, and then jumping out of New York without a degree finished, um, and then jumping back into graduate school and then out of one lab into another, those have been the things that really propelled my life in a way that might have been more boring, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you and, went to the greatest challenges yeah. uh, and you found your greatest treasures. Yeah. I, think, I think that's yeah. a good way of putting it. Yeah, that's, that's, the journey is so beautiful and, it, and that's what really stretches you to the brink of your, um, your abilities and it right. challenges you the most <laughs> and it puts you in a place where you're learning a lot. Right. Um, it's also interesting that you have this, um, this way of, of, of viewing um, teaching as something that is very, very valuable. You come in there, like you said, with a malleability so that the, the, the conversation can move whichever di di direction it needs with the students when they're asking questions. Right. Um, and I love how you found that interest in teaching and um, ethnobotany. So, all right, now, Ethnobotany in general is very interesting. The plant and human interaction is interesting. The coevolution is very interesting. It's mm -hmm. been, you know, b billions of years of evolution on the planet, millions of years of human evolution with plants. Mm -hmm. And we find ourselves now, in many ways, finally uh, becoming more and more literate with understanding some of the psychoactive properties of plant medicines. We find a lot of the nature therapy that's going on around the world where mm -hmm. we just walk into forest and it decreases our cortisol levels, right. all these types of interesting things. Um, yeah. What gardening does for the soul, these types of things. Yeah. So, yeah, so what have you been learning about this co-evolution? Well, I mean, actually something interesting, it's, I guess, what, 30,000 years of human plant like cultivation, really, but, um, and humans themselves in like 100 or more thousand years. Uh, that go back with humans and kind of being in this plant place, right? Because that's what we're in. It's a Earth. plant place. It's a plant place. I mean, it, it is. I mean, we evolved with them, uh, and 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 we all came 
we didn't just land on the earth from somewhere, we came out of the earth. So, you know, yes. we're all coming from this kind of same place, plants and people. And if you look at indigenous cultures, so people who kind of are endemic to their place, who still live where their ancestors lived and they have that knowledge, you see that plants are integral to their lives. And, I, and you might be thinking like food or medicine, but also like musical instruments and housing and anything, you know, the baskets that they carry everything in, all that their clothing, it, it all comes from plants. And that ethnobotany covers all of that. Yeah. And sometimes the term economic botany is used um, to just talk about how people use plants economically in any classification. Um, what I think for what I'm doing now at, at Harvard and MIT, uh, the most interesting things are looking at that indigenous knowledge and thinking about how it might be applicable to the things that we're doing now. What can we learn from indigenous people? Um, and for me, the greatest reward has come from thinking about not just the species that people choose for a particular purpose, let's say for a medicine, um, because people have known that they've collected plants of particular species to do particular things, um, health, healthful things. But indigenous people don't just choose a species, they choose what we might call in science world a phenotype. So, you know, actual expression of the plant. Mm -hmm. And that phenotype is influenced by the environment. So indigenous people understand that, well, I don't just pick, you know, this plant because it's this plant. I pick because it's this side of the mountain at this time of day and this time of year and this growth stage and all those other things that go into make, making an actual physical plant a physical plant. And what we found is that those things have a lot of effect on the chemistry of the plant, which is kind of the fundamental makeup of the mm. plant. And if we're talking about drug discovery or drug usage of a plant or any type of medicinal usage or food usage, we have to be aware of what those phenotypes, or we might even call them chemotypes, so the chemical type of that plant is, because that is what will give us the true benefit. So, you know, I'm working on some projects now where we're looking at produce. So all the produce, when you go to the store, you look at the point of sale where you actually buy the produce, and you may have heard that, let's say, apples are good for you. But what, what does that mean? An apple is not an apple is not an apple. An apple that was grown at a certain time of year is going to have a different chemical makeup than an apple that is grown at you know another time of year or yeah. a different place or any of these things will change drastically sometimes the chemistry and the I'll, variables of the environment that the fruit is grown in right and right the soil compositions the atmospheric compositions the Absolutely. amount of nutrients the water that it gets yeah so how early you pick it or late you pick it yeah how right. long you take until you eat it um, right. off right off of if you eat right off this probably has more of the nutrient value than if you wait a month sure you get yes it. yeah that's a good example um, also um, when insects or, or plants or some environmental stresses are on a plant or let's say a medicinal plant in particular you can sometimes get more and different phytochemicals plant chemicals that are good for for treating a disease let's say because often those chemicals that the plant makes that humans have found is useful are made not to give the humans a gift necessarily they're made to um, defend something defend the plant because again like I said they can't run away right so the plant is stuck in place it has both an active and an inducible defense system so an active defense system might be thorns but an inducible defense system will be some kind of metabolic regulation of the chemistry of the plant so that when a caterpillar is chewing on it, the plant changes its chemistry and upregulates the production of something that's going to prevent the caterpillar from eating anymore. Yes, yes. And those same compounds might be good for stopping cancer cells from dividing. That's and very that, interesting. Right? So that, and that we find this crossover a lot and humans have relied on this medicine in an anecdotal way for a long time. And the reason why this can be particularly important is because there's been some disdain in modern Western medicine for uh, herbal medicine or plant-based medicine because it's so complex. So, and, and modern medicine is very reductionist. So we like to have one compound that has one mechanism of action that treats one disease or condition. But the truth is that plants make thousands of compounds and they do many different things in the body at once. And those are admittedly very hard to track. In fact, we don't even have a good way to measure all those compounds in the plant. There are many different tests that it takes to piece together what you might call the metabolome or the entire chemistry of a plant. And it's expensive and labor intensive. So let's say we figured out all the chemistry and now we have to figure out, well, what do they do when they go in your body? 
and they might do a hundred different things on several different organ systems, um, just working in concert. Um, and they might treat, you know, you might look in an herbal book and say, well, what does this plant do? And it might say 10 things. That's very common because there are many different compounds that do different things. It may be that in the indigenous knowledge that you had to pick that plant at a certain time of year, certain type of the plant, that it would be better for this condition or something that may have been lost to the yes. historical record. Yes. Um, but, you know, this, that, that's how humans practice medicine for most of the existence of humans and plants. We were potentially, our edge of knowledge has actually receded a little bit over the last several thousand years of industrial revolution and uh, internet age. Um, especially our spiritual knowledge, our plant medicine knowledge, um, in some ways. Mm -hmm. In some ways, of course, we've got the scientific tools to be able to poke um, mm -hmm. deeper at the chemistries and whatnot. But um, the average um, person that lives in a metropolis uh, not only doesn't even get to see the stars that much, yeah. but they don't get to really touch the soil or um, or understand uh, the the season of of a plant medicine and how right. that can affect their biology. Yeah, it's just, it's very foreign to most modern people, I think, um, in the West at least, you know, or yeah. what we might consider yeah. the West. Um, I mean, eighty percent of the world uses plant-based medicine in some way. So they use accrued, you know, plant-based medicine in some way. And we're just m manufacturing molecules here. Yeah, but, I mean, we do derive some of our, we do derive, I think something like 60% of the drugs are in some way natural derived. So that might mean from an other, like a bacteria as well, but you know, they're coming from some natural source and then maybe they're modified or, or something that changes the plant chemistry in some way. Um, to be more suitable as a drug or something like that. So we do, we use those scaff chemical scaffolds to create a lot of the drugs that we use now, but most people don't have the ability to do that. I mean, they still have to use the plant in its crude form um, or make a simple extract in water or ethanol or something like that. Yeah. And we don't understand that. It's kind of a dark space where we don't fully understand how it's working. The, the, another way that we've talked about this on the show so many times is that it's been billions of years of evolution and we don't actually have a ledger of all of what has happened uh, in those biological processes. Like you said, when a caterpillar eats, eats at the leaf, the plant figures out a way to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could figure out some of the uh, processes of the you know biochemical pathways and all the different things that are actually occurring in there could we use some of those things to restore our homeostatic capacity back to like an 18 year old for a couple more years can we actually you know there's so much that we don't actually know um, because it's just been such a long period of time with so many different evolutions that have occurred and so um, we love thinking about like what from like the palette of evolution could mm -hmm. we apply to longevity or could we apply to uh, to to just living healthier and uh, more fulfilling lives? Um, I think uh, sleep more, don't drink alcohol. <laughs> yeah, these basics, sometimes it doesn't yeah. have to come down to a plant, right? I think yeah. that um, this is something that it falls under the same fallacies of Western thinking. I sometimes that there's a there's a, a treatment you can take that'll fix everything. But I think sometimes what's missing is some kind of holistic understanding of your own human body and the people around you. That's right. Um, so, you know, no, getting so the simple things, drinking enough water, sleeping enough, and eating a proper diet that is, you know, giving you the nutrients you need and uh, avoiding the things that you know provide oxidative stress that make you feel and look older, um, I think are probably the big things and then you know you can use plants to plants I often think of as they can support health so a lot of the you know plant-based drugs are actually things that are somewhat mild in their effect but they support well-being for some particular organ or some condition and then there are, and those might be for or even for chronic conditions or something but then there are acute medicines and for maybe acute illnesses so something very serious and that may be a really strong or potent poison that is given at the right dosage that treats something. So I worked with the Madagascar periwinkle for many years, uh, which produces vincristine and vinblastine. They're used for cancer. They stop cell division, just like I was talking about with the caterpillar. They, mm -hmm. It's what you might call an anti-feedant. 
So it stops the caterpillar from eating, but it also stops m rapid cell division in a human. Um, so that's an acute molecule that comes from a poisonous plant that we use, and there are several examples mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Digitalis, right, from foxglove, is something that if you just ate the plant, you might have a heart attack. Or, <laughs> you know, it's not good for your heart, but it's used as a drug for people that have that need their heart kind of uh, kickstarted in some ways, right? Yeah, so we're not in the right dosage. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're not different from our environment. We are our environment. Right, and yeah. when you view it from a holistic perspective, uh, the nutrition, the sleep, the exercise, mm -hmm. um, the social mm -hmm. environment, uh, yeah. when we're addicted to the devices versus the love and compassion mm -hmm. and empathy right. and, yeah. Yeah, and emotion and social there. Um, so all these things kind of tie into that holistic understanding of, of, of health. And then... Yeah, so this is th that's a lot of um, you know ethnobotany on on a on a kind of like a hu on a human um, in many ways a human level. Yeah, I like how you said it, uh, yeah economic uh, botany mm -hmm. is that's an interesting way of seeing yeah. it, how we actually move uh, goods. Also, it was cool how um, we move plants around the world. It was cool how you said that certain um, uh, populations of people still use the baskets. And the, uh, use the plants for their houses. Mm -hmm. the, this type of thinking is like plants right. are for like every part of their lives. I mean, this table is it's this is yeah. ethnobotany. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we re we forget these things. I think sometimes in the cotton, the cotton shirt, the shirt. Right? I mean, so those are all things that took a human growing it, um, but also, you know, maybe thousands of years of influence human plant influence to get that type of cotton that is good for a shirt yeah, yeah. or this wood in a place where it would be growing and then harvested yes. so um, yes. we just forget these things because it's not in front of us especially if we're in a city we don't realize how we enter it so so in the class I, I teach a class on environmental field work at Tufts and um, so I, the project really could be whatever I wanted it to be, but the project we focus on is urban forage. Yep. So that's like what plants around us are actually edible or, in, or medicinal, so we talk about that as well. Yep. And for the students, I think like they've never thought about that, and they have some sort of like plant blindness, it might be called, yep. where everything just looks green, and they don't know what is what. It, it's all grass or whatever to them. But when I take them out and we look at things and we start, as you look closer and closer, as you zoom in, you start to see there's many different species of things. and then there's stories behind every single one of those plants and they each kind of present on different plants throughout the semester. And then they catalog where all those are. They find out, well, this plant was brought from Europe because people valued it for this, or this plant was brought from a part of Asia because people used it for this. And that we can actually reclaim that power of knowing what the plants are around us and then even maybe even using them. And then maybe that changes how we do landscaping or maybe it changes how we live altogether. Um, not worrying about the weeds that go around us because they actually had some kind of function in our lives and they still can. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like when you, when you walk around and if you, if you want to care more, you can yeah. like double click into the Absolutely. greenery. <laughs> that is, we, yeah, we zoom in, we pinch yeah. and zoom. Pinch and zoom into yeah. the greenery. And then yeah. when you actually go there like face to yeah. a plant, and then you look, you know, next to it, and you see something different, yeah. and you wonder where is that plant from? How long has it, you know, been in this area? Who, mm -hmm. how did it get here? Yeah. What is its purpose here? Does it have insects living in it? What nutrients does it need? Right. How much sunlight does it need? Those, all those questions start to come for the student too, because it's a human thing, right? They start to be curious about all that, you know. And as part of that, we also do soil testing because, um, you know, there's at least a hundred, maybe more years of, you know. Uh, lead paint and gas stations and dry cleaners that have put stuff into the soil that can be taken up uh, into the plant. So we do Damn. some of that, and that's part of the environmental aspect of it as well. Yeah. But that is the current state of ethnobotany, right? I mean, we don't live in this pristine, you know, untouched glade where we can just pick anything and know that it's good for us. That's right. We have to be retaught and we have to look at things a little bit differently as well. That's right. What a cool class, the urban foraging class. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. just one of the classes that people line up to take. <laughs> yeah, that's I a try good to one. Cause we want students to be excited about this stuff, right? Yeah. So that's one. Uh, that's at Tufts. That's at Tufts. And then yeah. you, you also teach another class at Tufts called Cannabis Debate. Yes. So of course, students line up to take that course. I think I had a hundred emails from students who were pleading to get into this course and I felt bad we just didn't have the space. 
uh, uh, Monday was the last class. Um, I co-teach that class with my partner who's an attorney. Uh, it's called Cannas Cannabis Debate, uh, Science, Culture, and the Law. So I focus on uh, the science and some of the culture and he takes some of the culture and the law. Um, but it really is, uh, part of the reason we called it Cannabis Debate is because we wanted parents to be okay with it being on the transcript. Yeah, if we yeah, just yeah. called it Weed 101, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if, if it would be as cool. But and they, the administration uh, appreciated that and they fully have supported That's the class. That's awesome, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and uh, there is some debate, like at times it doesn't necessarily seem like uh, for, for recreational use of cannabis on yeah. an hourly basis is I mean, conducive sometimes to sure. productivity. Sure. I mean, yeah, but that's like a friend. I mean, that's right, but yeah, yeah. the debate is not like yes or no, should we have cannabis? And it's yeah. like the, the debate's nuance. over. Like, the nuance, yeah. In yeah. Cannabis, legalized cannabis is yes. here to stay. Yes, right? like, correct. Yeah. yeah, so prohibition has ended, we might think of it in, in many ways. Yeah. Um, ending and yeah. And, yeah, and and we will look back at, at this period of prohibition kind of as probably folly. I mean, Silly, yeah. especially what the ramifications of the war on drugs and things like that. Oh, have been this, this yeah. natural plant evolves with co-evolves with humans on Earth, and we're just going to ban it. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> it's yeah, horrible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's so, so much more nuance to yeah, it. Right. Yeah, it's great that the students are getting to engage. In yeah, and it's been really level. informative. And I mean, people ask me why did you teach this class? I mean, it's not my area of research or anything, but it actually is. I mean. It's a great example of ethnobotany. It's a great yes. example of human yes. plant interaction and how we have influenced the plant and the plant has influenced us. Yes. Um, and also, I, always, I think of cannabis as a, a kind of arrowhead, the spearhead that will get us to be able to speak fluently about many other medicinal plants. Cannabis isn't just THC and CBD. It's, it's maybe hemp. thousands. Right, I mean, there's yeah. hemp, but it, you know, there's just there's lots of molecules doing lots of things in that's your body, right, and yeah. there's lots of different cultivated varieties that are doing lots of different things. So that's the same thing with any medicinal plant. Um, if you were to look at ginkgo biloba or ginseng, and you were to buy ten bottles of it from you know some drugstore, you would have ten different chemical profiles likely because of the environmental conditions under which it was grown, the age of the plant, it would all change. And that's the same questions we're answering now with cannabis and, and we're grappling with the variability and how do we test for these things and what do we care about. Um, so if we can answer those questions with cannabis first, I think people may become more comfortable and regulators may find better ways to understand how we can uh, use these plant-based medicines better. Yeah, yeah, the, that's such a good class. I'm so happy that you're teaching <laughs> that one. And then there's also, you were telling me you were coming back. I want, to, I want you to give this example because it's kind of like a geopolitical example, like another part of the world. You're coming back from a conference in Barbados, mm -hmm. and Barbados has a high amount of, of sugarcane fields. Yeah. And so teach us about what an ethnobotanist, what their lens is when they look at. Yeah, sure. So, like I mean, there's so much because sugarcane came with slavery or slavery came with sugarcane, however you want to look at it. Um, and also many other plants. So Barbados um, is, is um, it, it's uh, an island unto itself. It uh, had an endemic botany, so it had lots of, of its own plants. The last assessment of the uh, botany of Barbados showed that there were just two endemic species left and the rest were all foreign plants that were brought into the island. Well, actually, that's not true. Some of them were um, indigenous plants, but not endemic, meaning they're not unique to that place. And then I think most recently said that they can't find the other ones. So there's only one endemic species left in Barbados um, of like 600 plant species or something like that on the island. Um, and that is because, and, and I'm getting pretty specific to Barbados, but um, there are lessons here. So Barbados was not, is not a volcanic island. It's a it's made of coral, so it's fairly flat. So it's easy for for it was used very flattened and cleared, and then put a whole bunch of sugar cane to fuel the rum trade or and, and sugar. Um, and bring slaves in to care for the sugarcane. It also brought other, other species like breadfruit, which was some people say was brought as food for the slaves, um, and other kind of tropical plants as well. Um, but basically it's a monoculture of sugarcane. That's what the agriculture in Barbados has been, sugarcane. And now the sugarcane is being supplemented by government just to keep things going in some way. There are a few rum distilleries still in Barbados that, that do that. Um, we, so it was me and several other uh, ethnobotanists there, we spoke about many things, but we wanted to, you know, give some perspective about what other types of agricultural endeavors could be pursued in Barbados. 
Um, one idea might even be cannabis, right? I mean, if there's going to be a global cl- cannabis trade of some sort, there's no reason why those sugarcane fields can't be cannabis fields grown for medicinal purposes or for, or for CBD or whatever. Um, yeah, so, it, I mean, from an ethnobotanist point of view, it's about interfacing with anthropology, botany, chemistry, pharmacology. Those are, when I teach about medicinal plants, those are the four pillars of understanding that I try to build that knowledge on. Yeah, yeah, give us the four pillars again. So, and this is for medicinal plants, uh, anthropology, botany, chemistry, and pharmacology. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, so for instance, the class I'm teaching at Harvard on medicinal plants, you know, that we present it in that order, and then we kind of culminate things by going for a plant walk and applying all those things. Yeah, yeah. that's great. And this is at Harvard and at Tufts. Yes, yes. This med, it's uh, the um, medicinal plants from the sacred to the scientific, and that's also right. the title of the book that will hopefully be out by the end of this year. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. What else about um, from the sacred to the scientific with medicinal plants should we know? Well, the, and the reason I uh, call it that is because, you know, some of the earliest understandings, that it may be, well, first off, it covers a lot of interest for people because some people are very interested in the anthropological and s- spiritual, social aspects of how people use plants. And I feel like you can't separate that from what we might think of as science. Those things have a lot to tell each other. Totally. Uh, so I think it's really about, I mean, part of this is about someone like me, who's a scientist who studies these things seriously and academically, I, uh, you mentioned, I mean, I'm a researcher at Harvard, I'm a researcher at MIT, I do things on this one level. But then saying I'm willing to talk about herbal medicine and I'm willing to talk about the spiritual side of how people have chosen right. plants, because I know that those things should, shouldn't be separated um, and that there's value to them. Uh, like I said, the majority of things that we use as medicine come from nature in some way. Are inspired by nature, so um, yeah. For me, it's about inter- it's integrated medicine, right? It's integrating uh, human health, uh, spirituality, so- social aspect, as you mentioned. That's part of health, yes. um, and making people feel more whole in some ways. Yes. I think, yes. and and allowing people to reclaim that. So I did. I mentioned that I just visited um, an herbal practitioner in in upstate New York. Her name is Susan Weed, uh, who I honor. Uh, every time I teach, I always mention her. Um, she's uh, sometimes calls herself a green witch. Yeah, uh, she yeah. uh, practices herbal medicine, and she is a great teacher. And what part of what she teaches that uh, herbal medicine is people's medicine. And I repeat that to my students and let them think about what that actually means. I mean, in some ways, it means it it should be and and can be accessible to most people. People don't need to rely on a man in a white coat giving a isolated compound in a white pill. Um, there are ways to use the plants around us as medicine. Humans have figured it out for a long time. Um, and although some scientists might argue, well, and that's the ideal way to do it, the truth is right now we're just not at a state where everyone can have access to those things. As, and we, we work towards that, towards having uh, the best medicine for everyone. But there are also ways to learn from those complex plant medicines that could still be good for people. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. There's a, the, the it's all under the umbrella of, of, of sacred to scientific. It's all under an umbrella of coevolution of, of humans with plants. Right. Yeah, yeah. Is is the um, the biotech that you're teaching at Northeastern? Yeah. What's a good uh, example of some of the core material from that? Yeah, so um, this class, um, it's an introduction to biotechnology, and biotechnology for most people nowadays, especially in the Cambridge, Boston area, uh, means working with protein drugs or large molecule pharmaceuticals. And a lot of these are actually for treating what I sometimes call diseases of the affluent, so things like cancer and other things that people live old enough to get <laughs> and at high numbers. Whereas, you know, in other parts of the world, people may be dying of infections and things at much younger ages. So, and it, and other reason it's affluence is tied to this because these drugs are incredibly expensive and incredibly, again, labor intensive to produce these drugs. So in that class, it traces the pathway of the biotechnological pipeline from uh, drug manufacturing side of things. Um, it doesn't really get into plant-based medicine because this is mostly has to do with genetically engineering 
um, let's say animal cells to produce a specific antibody drug or protein that will then treat some particular disease. But as part of that now, I've just put together a syllabus for an agricultural biotechnology course, which will cover all the ways that um, biotechnology has been used and can be used to change agriculture. I mean, everything, uh, people may have heard of golden rice, which um, was one of the first genetically modified uh, plant organisms that uh, allowed uh, humans to have access to nutrients that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Children were going blind from lack of nutrition and you know something like this is a way to so, so I mean I, there are a lot of people anti-GMO right broadly and even entire countries are anti-GMO but what they probably are actually anti are anti the business practices that are behind some of the work that's been done with genetically modified organisms because um, in plant biotech but humans have been doing some sort of, sort of biotechnology in that they're manipulating the plant genome in some way for thousands of years. People have been crossing plants and creating things. So human hands have had absolutely an influence. The cannabis plant did not get to the way it is without human influence. Um, the apples you eat are not, they may not be GMO in the biotech sense, but they were human or engineered things just like corn or wheat or any of these things were completely modified by human intervention. We kept wanting to pair for the genetics that we wanted. Right. Yeah. Yes. And then crossing things and making mutants of things and until we got what we wanted. And um, you know, the future of that is it has to be done properly, of course, but um, there's great potential for feeding, a, a, as I started this whole thing with uh, the idea of overpopulating the world. If the world is going to continue to grow in population, we have to find new ways that we can be innovative to feed the world. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. It may include genetically modifying crops and so that they're less uh, disease, uh, uh, they're more disease resistant, um, so that their yields are higher. I mean, that's kind of where we've gotten ourselves. Drought um, resistance. For better or worse, um, genetically modified organisms in some way are here to stay, and yeah. um, we. And if we're going to use them, we need to use them to solve these big problems like I kind of started talking about. Yeah. I think it was really fascinating when you said that the diseases of the affluent are the ones when you live long enough to be able to get the cancers, the well, I mean, dementia, like, like Viagra, right? I mean, that's not an essential drug for the world necessarily, but a lot of money, time, scientific expertise has been spent on that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's not to discount the research in the cancer drugs, totally, but totally. it's just that there, if we were to actually kind of have a level playing field, we looked yeah. at things like neglected tropical diseases. That's right. Um, yeah. You know, we would have a more fair way of looking at some of these. Yeah, things. yeah. But we want to we want to target the basic physiological needs that are not being met in the world, mm -hmm. and then go and um, alleviate that those. Um, uh, uh, ailments that come from that and then enable the full creative development of people mm -hmm. and then also tackle cancer and dementia and all these right. other big yeah. things at the same time. And another one of the things that you said was just that within biotechnology, and it's so good that you're teaching about it, that there is, you know, we work so much with IndieBio and I mentor there too, the largest seed stage biotech accelerator. Mm -hmm. And what they're working on are everything, especially uh, food wise, like, uh, like growing meat without the animals. All right, yeah. It's such a fascinating space. Mm -hmm. um, and th I think we're gonna be able to sustainably feed the world um, by uh, leveraging the tools that biotechnology can mm -hmm. and inspiring young people to get involved with it. You also do this a bit at MIT's Media Lab. Um, the Open Agriculture Initiative is fascinating. Um, the food computer, I saw the video of the food computer. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna embed that video here for everyone to see, but you do so much, so many sensors there, mm -hmm. CO2 sensor, temperature sensor, humidity sensor, and, uh, light panels. There's a new brain and a new interface and a cloud backend and you can mm -hmm. add sensors for pH and water temperature, electrical conductivity, extra cameras. I thought this was so cool seeing it. It looks yeah. like a little maker bot on a yeah. table and you can grow plants within it yeah. and see all the science that's happening. Yeah, so now we, now we can go really strange because all the things I've talked about have been about what you might think of like indigenous medicine, indigenous people. And, but I think that the uniqueness that I try to bring is, um, you know, of course, ethnobotanists have studied indigenous people. In fact, here at Harvard, um, the person who kind of popularized ethnobotany the most is Richard Schultes, and I ha I'm lucky enough to be working exactly where he worked. As a young person, I never thought I'd have that chance, but now at the Harvard Herbarium, 
uh, is exactly where he was working, studying these indigenous people and in some ways their technologies, right? We may not call it technology the way we think of technology, but humans develop technology to interface with the world, particularly when it comes to plants. So that's what ethnobotany meant. And for me, part of my mission has been to redefine what ethnobotany means. And that's why I've been so lucky to work at the Media Lab, which is really like the Harry Potter's magic studio of making magic things. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the subtitle so of the Media Lab. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, with so many amazing programs there. I, I gave a talk uh, about a year ago. The director of Open Agriculture at the Media Lab, Caleb Harper, um, was at the same conference and he invited me to come visit the laboratory, which is out at the Bates Laboratory at MIT, which is actually like 40 minutes north of Boston. At the old, It's a retired linear particle accelerator, uh, the pre-CERN uh, days, and uh, fascinating place, uh, spooky tunnels everywhere filled with kind of old technologies. But they gave us a warehouse where we put large shipping containers that we've converted into controlled growing environments. Love it. So that's what we do out there. So to me, this is the new idea of what ethnobotany can be. So looking at where people are now and how they interface with plants um, and what the future of that can be. So at open agriculture, one of our specialties is looking at controlled environment growing systems. Yes. And we have what's called the food computer, which is a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter unit that's completely scalable. So actually food computer is a general term for all the types of computers that we build that interface with our food or plants in any way. So I love that, I love that pairing of the words, food yeah, computer. Right, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and, and this tool, so this 30 centimeter, 30 centimeter box, which is, are, is those dimensions um, because of a NASA challenge. They wanted something that was this size that oh, could go up to the space yeah, station. Yeah, so that's why we made it that size. This is the third iteration and there'll be a fourth and a fifth already in the works for this. Um, the mission for us was to make a small unit that could actually be used for STEM and STEAM education. Yes. So this is something that we put into middle schools and high schools. It's in 65 countries around the world. Excellent. And it's cheap to make. Um, everything can be fabricated pretty easily, um, all from the same material. Um, and for cheap parts, you can buy it pretty easily. And then it's a, this mini controlled environment that allows you to grow something. We, our specialty has been basil. It's kind of like our lab rat for yeah, what we've been doing. Yeah, yeah. So we grow basil in these small uh, containers and, and we teach kids about plants. So yes. some of these kids don't know that a tomato comes from the ground in a plant. They think it just comes from a grocery store, right? They don't understand that connection, right? <laughs> but I mean, that really happens. They don't know that we get oh food from Oh my God, we're so deep in metropolises <laughs> that sometimes yeah. the kids not only don't see the stars, they don't know the food comes from the farm. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. So if kids don't know that, then what kind of like environmental stewards are they going to be? Like, are yeah. they going to care about who they vote for or anything if they don't even understand the simple process? Or even if they have a vague understanding, they don't have a tactile understanding. They're not, you know, for years, my partner and I had put together a school uh, gardens and community gardens. He was on the school board in the town that we lived in, and we would work to encourage that to happen and what we saw are kids for the first time interfacing with plants they learn a new uh, speed of time time passes differently yeah um, they have a new understanding for patience yes. <laughs> so all those things happen and when you have these little units they same idea you know they they have to watch this thing grow they see things go wrong or right and also while they're doing this all the variables that they're changing and all the sensors that you mentioned are uploading that data to the cloud yes. and forming what's called a climate recipe and then we can learn we use machine learning to learn from all these different iterations of how the plant grew it's always it takes images as well of the plant that's awesome um, so we use that to build a system a machine learning system yeah. so that same tool the food computer which is the, actually it's called a PFC edu personal food computer yeah. education for educational purposes so that's the personal food computer S using that same technology scaled up we built the a food server so this is a shipping container yes. size version um, we published a paper earlier this month in, in April it can grow um, food for communities yeah that. exactly yeah. so what we at the media lab it's a unique funding system where companies become members and they give us some sort of challenge and they can fund particular projects. So actually Target wanted to grow plants 
things like basil or herbs or high value products close to the store so they didn't have to ship them. Mm -hmm. But this same idea we've actually implemented in other places. So we've partnered with um, a Wellspun, the company, a cotton company in India, and we've actually put these contain. We've gone to India and installed these, help them install these units yeah. where they can grow specialty cotton inside these units and learn about the environment. And these tools are used not just for production. So you might be thinking, okay, how much? can I grow in this thing and how, like I can't grow an apple in them, right? Because it's kind of not built for that. But you can use this tool to, not just for production, but you can also use it as an experimental platform. So it allows you to isolate specific variables. Yes. So if you wanted to know what happens when an insect is on this planet or what happens when I change the pH or if I change the temperature, um, then it will give you some information about the plants that you're growing themselves. In fact, it could help you choose which cultivated variety of the plant you're gonna put out in the field. We recently built what we call the tree computer. So we work with Ferrero, who's um, the maker of Nutella and Ferrero Rocher. So it's a confectioner, but think about how m uh, many other practical implications this might have. They said, you know, we grow, most of the hazelnuts in the world, which is what they use for Nutella, yeah. are grown in Turkey, which doesn't have a perfectly stable uh, governmental situation. It doesn't have, uh, there's problems with pests coming in and they wanted to diversify in other parts of the world. So they said, can you build us a, one of these computers that we could put a tree inside and then figure out which climate might be best to grow a variety. So we did that, we built this tree computer. Um, we put them in there and then we test extremes like extreme cold, extreme heat of targeted environments around the world. And then we can tell them, okay, you wanna grow in Adelaide, Australia, we punch in the environmental extremes, then we see, okay, eight of these cultivars will never live there and two of them would do okay. So then that saves them a lot of time and money and says, okay, we'll promote these two cultivated varieties and we'll grow them there. And the same thing could happen. That helps us make more food, right? It helps us have a better world in general because we're not wasting time and money and effort. You're running all of the <laughs> permutations of the possibilities of where plants can most effectively grow around the world way faster than an organization right. could. You gave the example of an unstable um, potentially country where a majority of the uh, plant is grown or another one is uh, when you drop an insect into the personal food <laughs> computer and then you can literally watch the variables change right. yeah. on how that insect is affecting mm -hmm. it. That That is so cool and I 65 countries around the world now right. with these um, the scalability you can take it from 30 30 centimeters yeah. all the way up to and people are riffing on them because we yeah. everything's it's open agriculture so we don't keep anything secret it's an open even, source initiative yeah so that's the real key here because even though we have to partner with Target and Ferrero and these other companies because that's the model of the media lab um, they have to agree to make everything open to the public so typically that's these controlled so awesome. environments are incredibly privately held, the technology is yeah. sequestered and you never hear about and these And the targeter for, would want to keep it for themselves right. and then maybe distribute their patent to other right. companies and make money. But in this case, you're doing it as an open learning initiative. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's so cool because then other people around the world can pick up the, sh the big shipping containers mm -hmm. and like you said, be growing for their community. And there may be a question like, well, this seems very expensive and you know, how would people in developing parts of the world um, participate in this. Um, the vision is that, well, the technologies are being developed. We want as many people who can be a part of it, be a part of it. And what we want people is to be a, a part of the destiny, not subject to it, or a part of the development of the technology, not subject to the technology that's delivered to them. So that's why we have, we have um, an online community that, you know, we hear from them, they ask questions, and it's very participatory. So the idea is, you know, open source and open knowledge and having people share and improve on that knowledge. Yeah, you get to the edge, you make a massive new open source advancement mm -hmm. and then that does not keep it you know, closed off. Right. Um, it pushes the edge further, faster. And then teach us about the flavor cyber agriculture as well, reducing waste, meeting demand, maintaining flavor, providing nutrition, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, flavor cyber ag, so cyber ag is kind of the term for these types of devices and what we're doing here. Cyber just being like computerized agriculture in some way. Mm -hmm. um, this flavor cyber agriculture was the name of the paper that we just published about a month ago that showed that we could modulate, we could tune the flavor of basil in some ways just by modulating. In this case, we were doing light, UV light and different times of, yeah. of exposure to that light. Um, but the bigger picture of this is, is the tunability of a plant in some ways. Yes. So this idea that indigenous people have understood this for thousands of years, that 
you pick a plant on this side of the mountain at this time of day with this weather because it gives you this product. Yes. We can now iterate and experiment on in a cyber agriculture uh, unit. And we could say, okay, what do we need to do to tune this? Let's say we wanted to make a medicinal plant. Let's say we wanted to make an anti-diabetes basil because we grow a lot of basil. Um, what do we wow. need to do to change that plant so that it produces most of that chemical that will be anti-diabetic wow. for people around the world who can't get insulin or metformin or some other anti-diabetes medication? That's some of the work I did uh, in my previous research before I came here, and it's some of the work we're continuing to do now at MIT. It's so fascinating being able to tweak this in the age of cyber agriculture, the different variables, and be able to produce different uh, medicines um, and uh, flavors and all of this cool. That's so interesting. Um, what is the future of ethnobotany? I think we're defining it. I think that um, so ethnobotany, you know, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, people were very interested in uh, how can we discover drugs from plants that are in parts of the world we haven't discovered. So ethnobotanists had a real value to big companies for going out and discovering and identifying all these plants. Again, like I said, a lot of that work was done by Richard Schultes and his students at Harvard. Um, now, then it kind of dissipated a bit, I would say, because drug companies became not as interested. They weren't finding as many leads from nature that they used to. It was very labor intensive. And then now we've, we've been a bit, I would say for the past maybe 15, 20 years, we've been trying to define what the future is. I mean, I'm trying to do that with my fellow ethnobotanists. I published a paper two years ago called Ethnophytotechnology. Mm -hmm. So that's taking ethnobotany and biotechnology and smashing them together. Because really that is, ethnobotany is a science of studying plants and people. Biotechnology is a people-driven uh, a people driven science that relies on nature in some way. So it's just natural that we, we do plant biotechnology, right? But what if we incorporated the human aspect even more? What if we incorporated the ethnobotanical understanding of how people have used these plants? Or even just the notion that humans have understood that environment changes plant chemistry and then start to utilize that knowledge in pipelines to discover new things or make things better from the plant perspective. Um, that, I think the future is integrating these things all the way from biotech to artificial intelligence. I mentioned machine yes, learning. Yes. All, all, these, all these iterations of experiments we do, all the data, because there's so much data, all those sensors, it's like an Internet of Things idea, right? So we, I gave a talk on the Internet of Food not too long ago um, because now we have all these sensors uploading all this data. How do we utilize that? IOF. Yeah, right. Food. <laughs> I am off. Yeah. So we, uh, the way that we use it is we put it into machine learning models and we, that's the entire paper that was published was based on, we worked with a company <coughs> called Cognizant, which has, I think, 280,000 employees around the world um, who has an interest in modeling things. Um, and they used, you know, the most modern techniques in artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to give us these outcomes. Um, so I think the future is just recognizing where humans are now using that, honoring and, and utilizing some of that indigenous knowledge and then making sure we're sharing the, that around the world. So that's one aspect I didn't. That's beautiful. Right? It has yeah. to be shared back to the whole world. So we're going all the way from sacred and indigenous plant medicines to the internet of food, the, uh, the food computers, the machine learning algorithms that we have now and we're open sourcing right. that wisdom. So we're combining right. and open sourcing. I, I love that. Because so the much. history of the world has been stealing from people who are weaker and then using it for the people who the victors, right? But we're trying to reverse that in some way. If we can take some of this knowledge, improve upon it and have it be open source for everyone to use, I think that's a better model for living even in a world that keeps growing in population where food and plants are going to be vital to our survival. I think it's the the best way forward. And what a beautiful thing to have the companies like uh, Target uh, or a Walmart or an uh, Amazon or an Apple, the largest companies in the world, across the world, even in China and whatnot, um, to be uh, open sourcing the technology that they're working with cool uh, institutions like Media Lab so that they get access to it immediately because they funded it as well, but then the, it's democratized as well right yes. away. I love that process so much. Um, I think that's kind of like open notebook science at the edge mm -hmm. of knowledge and that's I think that's a lot of our future. Um, two quick questions on the way out that we like asking our guests. The first question is 
John, do you think we're in a simulation? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. That's my, that's my, <laughs> maybe people won't have watched all the way to the end of the <laughs> interview. Uh, I, what is a simulation, right? Um, artificial intelligence, someone asked me what is artificial intelligence and I said it's, in, it's intelligence, <laughs> right? Because um, we're recreating that now. I, I, I absolutely open to the possibility that we're in a simulation. Um, yeah, I think, in, in fact, like to my mind, sometimes it makes the most sense, especially for the, you know, even lis listening to my story, there have been so many times where things have been too bizarre to explain. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's I'm gonna part go of from a farm to Manhattan. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But also all the little things you don't mention, the, the repetitions that happen, the, the cues that you see. Yes. Um, those are things that people have attributed to spirituality and God and yes. other things. Um, so just as bizarre is a simulation. So I think <laughs> put that up there with explaining the unexplained. Um, I, I think that we should not be so arrogant to think that we have it all figured out on this little tiny speck of dust yeah. floating in space. Um, I mean, that, that's really how, that, I guess that's essentially how I feel. I'm, I'm open. If I weren't open to bizarre, crazy ideas, I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing. So I think, of course, we could be in a simulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love it. I love it. Um, there's, there's also the um, what we'll learn as we, uh, in the next couple of decades, hopefully um, run our own simulations and be able to mm -hmm. analyze the way that uh, the humans evolved. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you're right, the attribution of to uh, what happened pre-Big Bang, why mm -hmm. are we here, right. all, that, all these yeah. interesting questions. Yeah. Um, all right, and the last question is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world. I should have watched your other expecting <laughs> so maybe it's better than I know. Um, you know, I was I, I can't remember the name for it, but Hega? Have you heard of this term? The like Norwegian term or something for um, this kind of centered peacefulness that comes from being around people that you love and they love you and they understand you. I think that um, even if you're in like a cabin and it's dark outside and cold, you can have some comfort because you're around people who understand you in some way. So I think that people are always trying to get there. People, I think a lot of humans are always trying to get to a comfortable place where they feel useful, but also know that people understand what they are. I think that feeling is probably the most beautiful thing in the world because it's so unique because a lot of the things around us are relatively inert, but it's almost like the highest form of evolution or something, right? Like the ability to, that incorporates love and peace and all those other things, but then feeling useful and feeling loved and feeling like you can communicate with someone. I think that that, that can be the most, most beautiful thing in the world. Oh yeah, that's well, well said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one of the deepest human feelings. Right. For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. And every human, um, deserves to have that absolutely dignity. that's what we're yeah. Yeah, yeah when the simulation is doing a really good job yeah that's right when <laughs> we have that feeling when we push yeah. the new code deployments the updates right. and humans can have that feeling um, all the base physiological needs covered. that's so right if, if yeah. we could encapsulate that feeling and say okay like I have I've felt this and now I know that everyone in the world should have the ability yes. to feel this then then that just expands all the beauty that's right yeah, that's right. yeah. John De La Parra, what an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Thank you, Thank so, you so much, much. for Thank coming on to the Appreciate show. It. Yeah, this has been such yeah. a pleasure. Uh, so enlightening. Thank you for teaching us about ethnobotany right. and about the craziness of food computers yeah. and the cannabis debate course, all this kind of stuff. So fascinating. We're excited to continue on building a relationship and uh, making connections for each other. Um, you're welcome, of course, anytime back in the Bay Area. Join us on the show again. We'd love to do that. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Go and share more conversations about ethnobotany, everything from the sacred and the indigenous all the way to the new internet of food era. Share that with your friends, your families, your coworkers online. Go and start talking about it more and inspiring more people to build the future in this regard. Check out John's links below as well. Go and support him. 
Also support the artists, entrepreneurs, and organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation, our links are below, so you can continue doing cool things like coming to the Boston area and interviewing people like John. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.